Welcome to another episode of Investing in IP with Dave. Today we have a very special guest with us. This gentleman has created a, a revolutionary product, the Q Collar, which you may have seen on athletes in a professional realm from football to soccer to hockey. This is the only product in a market that is FDA approved to prevent traumatic brain injury. Let me say that again. This is the only product in the market that prevents traumatic brain injury. Please help me welcome Dr. Dave Smith. Well, good morning, Dave. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And and, and thanks for uh, giving me some time here this morning to talk about uh, your product. And, and uh, I would like to, I guess, kind of go through, because you have a number of businesses and things like that that you created that kind of involves IP and uh, looking forward to kind of talking about those different things. But I guess the the most recent and, and, and maybe, I guess, well-known at this particular point in time is a Q-collar, which uh, just reading about, I, and I have seen, because you know, football is my favorite sport, and just kind of coming from uh, the collegiate round playing football, and I noticed uh, maybe a year or two ago these Q-collars, and I, I guess I figured that they had something to do with uh, concussions and headaches since that was the, I mean, yeah, and brain injuries since that was the big like theme and, and topic of recent years in the NFL, at least, or in football. And uh, but I, I guess I never knew the ins and outs of it, and uh, just kind of doing some research for this podcast. And uh, man, the story is amazing. And uh, and, and just growing up, I'll tell you, I, I mean, I've had a few concussions back in my day, which I wish this thing was around as I was growing up and playing football. I maybe maybe uh, would have been better off at that point, uh, uh, having maybe been able to prevent some of those concussions. Uh, but can you, I guess, kind of talk a little bit about? the inspiration of just kind of getting into this realm of raw before we even get to the Q collar, but the whole traumatic brain injury. Cause it seems like that story in and of itself was uh, a pretty interesting story. Interesting story. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, you asking right from the beginning of how I kind of got into this crazy world. Well, not necessarily from in a crazy world, but just, I think the, the, the TBI, I, I, I'm just how uh, your research began on the traumatic brain injury specifically, which ultimately led to, the invention of the Q collar. So I know you had the 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 the, the, the wound dress in that company, and and I, right. I don't want to get off to that at some point, but just kind of starting from, okay, what made you start diving deeper into this traumatic brain injury, th th that side of things? Uh, right. Well, strangely enough, the the story kind of lies from that wound care company. I was consulted by somebody in the military complex on an idea that they had had, but they were struggling and making it into reality. And uh, they consulted me. We put a product together to help our soldiers not bleed out on the battlefield. And they asked me to present at the Army Research Lab. This is around 2008, 2009. And uh, after I was done, the project coordinator came up, kind of put his arm around me and said, wow, that was very clever. He says, I wish clever people would figure out traumatic brain injury, $100 billion in nearly 100 years, and we're struggling to move the needle on traumatic brain injury. Well, suffice it to say, uh, one of the guys in the audience who raised his hand and says, I think if somebody could figure out how a woodpecker can smack its head into a tree 80 million times at 1,200 Gs, when we get a concussion at 100 G, well, how could that animal do it? Just figure that out and we'd be golden. Well, six months later, I did figure out how really all of the highly G-force tolerant creatures are capable of doing it. Um, I evolved a theory called slosh theory that then evolved into a number of different products to help mitigate from the inside how the brain handles impacts and blast waves and things of that nature. And so it was really at the Army Research Lab, and here I am, nearly 15 years later, we have a second device that we're actually interacting with the military again. The cue collar is all over the military. There's a $5 million grant to study it being done right now at Fort Liberty. Um, that, I'm told by little birds, that is going very, very well. Uh, this cue collar uh, works by volumizing the brain space, and so... Think about it when you're in a car, you put your seat belts on and your airbag may go off or your pretensioners are trying to prevent you from moving around within the car itself. And that's what nature figured out first. So she's got her own airbags and those airbags deploy by just compressing the jugular veins and then boom, 
about four milliliters, that's the size of, size of a small Easter egg, of backfilled blood goes into the brain. The brain can't move. And now impacts go right through your brain instead of being absorbed by your brain. So I have a, I have a question. This seems like it's from maybe from your uh, standpoint. Why do you think, because it seems like when you got on this topic and really started delving deep in it, you like you said, you figured it out six months, eight months, uh, relatively quickly compared to the 100 years and all the money that had been spent into it. Uh, I guess kind of maybe... Starting with that, why do what do you think they were missing, or they were obviously they weren't focusing were focusing on the right uh, issue as it relates to the, the brain volume and whatnot? Well, why do you think that is? Because that just seems and that, that seems like a yeah. hundred billion dollars and 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 not moving the needle at all. It seems like they were completely off. Well, they weren't completely off. Um, mm -hmm. You know the, the the problem, I guess, because uh, many ask this question. You know, Dave, you really don't look that bright. Right. So how, how did you come up with this? Right. And and in reality, uh, I just have a confluence, a multitude of different strange backgrounds. So believe it or not, I'm a trained uh, chemist. I have formal training in physics and upper level math. And then I went into medical school and physiology. And then I just happened to be an entrepreneur. I owned a lot of real estate. By the time I got out, I ended up interfacing with uh, the technology departments of a development firm that were making wound dressings for Pfizer, they went under and then they had this, and I, I was already interested in their intellectual property. And I actually showed up at an auction, if you can believe that, and bought all of the intellectual property in the entire pilot plant, RES sitting down for $27,000. So I was off to the races with a fully functioning pilot plant, which enabled me to play. I mean, I, you put a brain like mine in a lab like that, where I can start changing things and not do it at you know enormous expense. Um, I started creating clever little ways of dealing. We were putting all kinds of things in our wound dressings, Manuka honey and uh, elemental uh, uh, silver. And again, this was 20 years ago. Right. You know what I mean? So I know it's done like crazy now, but we were sort of forging a way into that pathway. Mm. So so then, like you said, in 2008, you kind of figured this out, relatively speaking, quickly. And 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 you see that the Q College just now having come out over the last, you know, two or three years or so. Uh, why that gap in time? And man, I think I understand just dealing with the FDA and all the, the hoops that they make you jump through as it relates to kind of proving to them what you already know. Can you kind of talk about a little bit about that aspect of it? Uh, of sure. I guess that, that, time, that time period between you figuring it out and kind of dealing with the FDA to convince them what you already knew or had figured out? Right. Well, I think you'll find most times that you talk to entrepreneurial types, the, the part that makes us stay up at night is, is where we're going to get the money and the funding to be able to move this forward. And so, you know, I was a pretty successful internal medicine doc. I was chief of medicine at one point. Uh, real estate things. And yet we put $15 million into this cue collar. I did not have $15 million stuck to the bottom of my shoe. So I, I needed to find a way to get this knowledge out to anyone and everybody that would listen to me, you know, literally screaming from, from the tops of roofs. And that didn't do very much. I, I interfaced with the military around 2009 with my ideas. That wasn't going well. Nobody to be honest with you, I think people thought I was an idiot. You know, I mean, come, come on, fucking woodpeckers and head ramming sheep. I mean, this is a serious enterprise over here, doctor, you know. And so ultimately, I needed to start doing studies that I could afford to do and then bring ideas forth. And I did a lot of that with visuals. So if you do get on my website, if you do go read my book, you'll see lots of visual stuff trying to help people understand what are basic physics principles, but they're not basic if you've never been taught them, right? So I, the fastest way to do that was with visual and a video of things or things of that nature. And so that helped me get a lot of people in my camp and then uh, ended up getting academic people on board initially and then right into football and professional sports. And then the military came circled back around later and I've got my own set of uh, difficulties in that breaking through the, the military world. It's a completely different, uh, uh, you know, vernacular. They, they, they don't talk the same way that you and I do. Huh. You know, so all of that's been very challenging. And then you throw on top of that COVID-19, 
Uh, you throw on top of that back in 2008, JIDO, which was the Joint Improvised Explosive Device Defeat Organization, funded to $9 billion, was suddenly defunded. We, we, we were at the highest level of, of involvement with the military, and the entire, the entire department just disappeared. I mean, that took two and a half years out of my life, right? And so I had to basically start over, and then we ultimately funded it privately. So the Q collar that you see out there, all that money that was involved came from individuals and people that uh, stepped up and said, hey, we're, we're either in the marketing world or we're in the textile world and we're interested. And I had to kiss a lot of frogs to find the people <laughs> that, that actually I wanted to partner with to move forward. No, that's interesting because, and, and as I was telling you before, just trying to throw that IP perspective, that IP theme on, I guess, uh, different guests that I bring going, because again, like you said, you've been at this thing for a long time as an entrepreneur. It's not necessarily a, a, a you know, everybody thinks it's this, but it's, 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 it's kind of like a, a sine wave where uh, you have successes and failures at different points and it can take time, uh, no, a, a decent amount of time. Definitely not uh, as long as you would probably want for something to uh, break. And especially if you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna get military funding and things like that. And then all of a sudden that goes away. What, what would you say was the biggest break? Because that's, uh, I, I just feel like that's important when you're talking about, uh, you know, entrepreneur story and everybody seems like has that break at one point or another. Did you realize that this was a big break when it did happen? Uh, or did you maybe just think this was part of the process? So I'm not sure if you understand that question, but I guess maybe number one, when was the big, when was your big break as it relates to the Q collar? Especially if you have to have to raise all this money from a private standpoint. Uh, and did you know at the time that this was a, a, a break that would uh, go a long way? Yeah, well, believe it or not, I, I, I knew instantly that I, I was correct. I mean, these principles, once you actually watch, I, I have a 30 minute talk that I give to a number of different venues. Um, you'll go, this isn't complicated. Why, why, why didn't say, yeah, but you've got to piece these parts of the puzzle together and then it's not complicated. So the, the strange thing about intellectual property is, is that a patent means nobody else came up with this idea. It has to be totally novel. And so you have to have some kind of a strange brain. And you don't know me very well, Dave, but everybody that does says that they <laughs> have a strange brain. So, you know, I've got over 40 patents now. And, and that demonstrates that I try to think in different ways. And so that has enabled me to, to see things that, Others may not see immediately, but then pick it up as, as I bring these visuals on board to help them, you know, bring up their physics and then bring up their physiology. And then, oh, let's not forget there's chemistry involved here. And some of these subjects are really dry and I'm just a nerd. I like that stuff. Right. And, and then I just started to realize that, um, the world had taken a left-hand turn on traumatic brain injury, it had gone after something called shear strain theory around the turn of the century because about 15 different scientists weren't chemists at the same time. So it turns out that blood is a very unique structure and it's something called non-Newtonian shear thinning. And that gives us unbelievable capability to cavitate, to form little bubbles inside it that, that expand and then contract. And then I just went, oh my God, I, I really think I know what's happening. Bottom line to answer your second question, uh, I actually presented this to Dr. Julian Bales. You might remember him because uh, 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 Alec Baldwin played him in the movie Concussion. Will Smith played Bennett Amalu, who was the brilliant Nigerian pathologist who came up with the concept of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And Julian Bales was actually presenting to Congress at the time on the My TV screen as the expert for the NFL Players Association on concussion. And I, I looked at the guy next to me and I said, I think that guy really needs to meet me. And then I woke up the next morning and I went, damn, I really think he needs to meet me. And so there I go, picking up the phone. And I do have the MD after my name, but it sure didn't work. I'm trying to get to the chief of neurosurgery at West Virginia University. His secretary, oh my God, we're best friends now. But I mean, she was like, what? Dr. David, so I've never heard of you. You know, mm. you, you live in Richmond, Indiana at the time anyway. I've never heard of that. And I ultimately, she says, what is it that you want me to page the chief of neurosurgery about? Oh, about a woodpecker. 
you know, and how, you know, I mean, it was bad. And yet I got through and in five minutes, Bales knew that my theories had to work. And then we went off on a sort of a, a plan. We had composed a big study and he said, listen, you know, in my work, I've never seen a 1% reduction in traumatic brain injury. Helmets don't, don't ever get to make that claim, right? He said, so if your concept of jugular compression blocks even 2% of brain injury in my lab with my people, we'll partner with you at West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Money, we'll do your first patents and da, 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 da. And we blocked 83% of brain injury on our very first study. And he woke me up at two o'clock on a Friday night, squirming like a little school child. Do you understand what this means? I'm going to introduce you to every. It was really cool. So that's kind of where it all began. Wow. No, I did. It, but so for me, that it almost is a, a good thing, but it can be a frustrating thing when you're like screaming to everybody, hey, this is, this is it, this is it. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, whatever. Whatever. And then obviously it kind of comes to fruition later on, but uh, it's this kind of belief in yourself that you know you're right and you know you have something that's a game changer. And now you just have to kind of wait for everyone else to kind of get on board with it. Uh, I, biggest, I guess another, go ahead. So I was just going to say that the biggest naysayer is, is me. I mean, I, I didn't believe any of this, to be quite honest with you. And so I set out starting to do experiments. I I actually had little CO2 cartridges filled with my own human blood. I was up at the top of my hospital whipping these down into the parking lot. People thought I was insane, right? But I, I needed to prove to myself that filling the cartridge of, of human tissue, blood, yeah. filling it all the way to the top, it stopped the damage, yeah. the blood inside the cartridge. So all of a sudden I had this little one-up little study and a few people started to go, oh, maybe he's not completely crazy. And right. then we started interfacing with the, probably the most prestigious research institution at the present time is Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Believe it or not, they were ranked number one by the US, uh, USA Today as the best research uh, institute in the United States at the moment. And so the bottom line is, is I ended up getting in with the human performance lab and I gave them my preliminary data and we showed them all the things that we had done and they were pumped because this is a conundrum that no one's been able to really move the needle. And this was potentially revolutionary and hopefully it continues to be. All right. So then from an IP perspective, specifically with the patent, was it uh, intentional to maybe not file on anything until and, and until, because you know, you said that the the, the chief of uh, neurosur uh, neuroscience at West Virginia, he said, "Okay, we'll help you all along with the patent." Was it uh, uh, intentional to not kind of do that or file on that beforehand, or did you not want to, I guess, do it and make those claims without having kind of tested the theory? Got it. So, <clears throat> I, you know, I have forty issued patents, but I probably have ninety provisional patents. Okay, so. Sure. I use these as bookmarks, just like the patent office does, yep. right? I mean, and I know your audience is yep. very savvy on all of this, but you know, nobody opens your provisional patent. Wow. patent. You got 12 months to convert that into a utility patent where it just disappears. So I do provisional patents all the time. I wake up in the middle of the night sweating and writing down provisional patents uh, only because, you know, it can cost me three to $500 to get that, you know, bookmark in place. And then I got a year prove what I believe I've come up with. Um, and then the utility patent, depending upon your patent lawyer, is anywhere from $5,000 to $7,000 to get that thing done correctly anyway. And again, these are medical, technical, difficult concepts. And if I can't put them into writing, they don't exist. Right. So it's a really cool discipline to force yourself into your lawyer-like brain. Um, and Because you guys are weird too, let's face it, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. We're different, that's for sure. <laughs> We're different, and and I had to learn to do that. But honestly, my my chemistry and math background helped me partition that down into certain pathways that and and rabbit holes and things that I had to answer. So uh, ultimately, the the cost goes up enormously. And believe it or not, just doing a utility patent at West Virginia that might have saved me seven thousand. That was not going to help. But we also got a hundred thousand dollars seed money. That helped. Because now, and they did this massive study, and it was rats. Don't get me wrong; we don't have any rat lovers out there. 
couple of rats did devote their life to our project. But ultimately, we were able to start convincing academics that I was onto something because they're the ones that said, hey, this was not invented here. What 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 organization are you? You're you're with a private hospital. You're you're not a major researcher. It was really a tough road to hold for a lot of the academics that just did not believe that science can be done unless you're in the hallowed walls of a major teaching institution. And ultimately, I was. I was made uh, a visiting professor at the likes of C University of Cincinnati, Cincinnati Children's, uh, University of Chicago North Shores. Uh, I worked with uh, the Mayo Clinic. I've worked with Harvard. I mean, these are all people that are on my uh, publications. We have 28 published articles on this, on all my topics with all those amazing institutions yeah. that adds to my credibility that enabled me to go to private investors and things of that nature and get them to realize we're on to something really big. No, and, and that's, that's interesting. You said that because it seems like you had to go through the bureaucracy of, uh, I guess, yeah. academia to kind of convince them as you know, you would think of, hey, if I kind of invented a product, I'll just go see a patent attorney and, you know, file it to the extent that I have everything in order, whether it's a provisional, like you said, which is relatively inexpensive compared to another provisional, which needs to be, or utility, which needs to be buttoned up and have all the, you know, drawings and all the formal requirements that the USPTO requires. But you have to ha had to go through, it seems like, this bureaucracy of academia. And we all know when you're trying to make those type of claims, you also have to go through the FDA, which... Hey, anybody knows anything about the federal government, they don't move fast. Uh, so it seems like you had a, a lot of different hoops to jump through. But then once you kind of jump through all those hoops and, and, and again, an 83% reduction, that's crazy. And, and something that I found out from uh, just kind of researching in preparation for the podcast is the helmets itself just seems like they more so help with uh, the school and not, you know, damaging the school. And really, they don't help at all as it relates to the brain, which, uh, again, concussions coming from in the brain slots, which the brain moving around. Uh, so then having did all that, now you have to, you're trying to build a company or, or, or help with building up a company. So, and like you said, you have to go to private investors or maybe somebody to help I guess, start a company around this thing that you finally convinced everybody that it does work. I guess, how was that process as far as, okay, we have something that works with the Q collar. We have uh, established that it does prevent traumatic brain injuries. And now, okay, let's make a business and start selling these things. It seems like that was a completely different calculation from everything that you did up until that point in time. You are spot on. Um, you know, helmets do exactly what they were designed to do. They will prevent you from having a skull fracture, and that's very serious. Um, but I will point out that skulls are bone, and bone heals to 110%. Brain doesn't heal at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it hardly heals at all. And so the other thing that a helmet will do is to help prevent you from getting your eye gouged out. Um, you know, but beyond that, there's just really no evidence that they've been able to block concussion. So you can put a massive amount of foam, but if your head moves in one direction to another because of an impact, your brain can't, can't, can't deal with that. Yep. So it's not attached strongly like a, like your seatbelts attach it. And so when your skull moves away at 30 miles an hour, your brain's still sitting back over where it used to be. Oh. And that literally creates vacuums and shearing and strain and havoc inside your brain. So we realized very early by looking at nature, I mean, I literally took that guy who was heckling me, you know, at the army research lab, going, I just think that someone could figure out how to whip it. Well, that really stunned me, right? As a medical doctor, I see 25 people a day. I don't even know when you walk in the door if I've got an answer at all to your problem, right? But I knew nature had already figured this out. Right. So even in my little mantra of who I am now 15 years later, it's Dr. David Smith. Nature is my mentor. I mean, that's where I think everybody should start. We have to fail fast as inventors. We can't just come up with an idea and 25 years later, you know, take it into practice. And so I always want to shoot myself down as quickly as I possibly can. Well, nature's been around for humanity for 20 to 30, 40 million years, depending on how you look at it. And there's a lot of trial and error and natural selection. So that's what I started to realize is, is if these creatures have come to realize that, that, that 
thicker skulls aren't going to do it. And remember, you've got a helmet up here. You know, that, yep. what, what makes sense putting a helmet over a helmet and expecting a massive change when everything inside it can slosh around? Right. No, yeah, for sure. And that's, a, like I said, that, that's, that's a big thing. And it was an interesting quote that you had uh, mentioned from, I think it was Dr. Daniel Spate, which said that the TBI is responsible for more, you know, cost of human suffering than cancer, heart attack, uh, heart disease, and strokes all put together. And I, I guess I hadn't thought about that, but if you think about, I guess, kind of having a TBI when you're uh, younger, and then I guess having to deal with the effects of that uh, throughout your life, which, uh, like I said, I, I hadn't thought about it in that way, but uh, I guess that seems like an accurate statement. Uh, I, I, I guess maybe, you know, moving on as far as, okay, you start the company, why the name first off? Why, why the name Q College? Because it seems like it's an interesting, uh, uh, inter interesting story behind uh, kind of the name Q Collar for the actual product. Right. So got to back the truck up just a little bit. Uh, yeah. I formed a medical company making wound dressings that was called Zenovate. And then we evolved uh, into the whole company taking a left hand turn when some of these ideas started coming. And we formed a new company called Traumatic Brain Injury Innovations. Pretty catchy name, huh? No, it's a big help. <laughs> but we started to seek out either venture, uh, joint venture people. Uh, ultimately, uh, unhappily, we formed a, a license ar arrangement. So those that are inventors, that, that is certainly acceptable. And if there's massive dollars that have to be thrown at something, many of these uh, entities, companies, and whatnot, they don't necessarily want a joint venture. They would much rather license that. Mm -hmm. So if you get a 7% royalty, 93% of it goes to that company. And yeah. so there's a higher reward for the other side if they can get you to license. Well, we were just running out of money. So we ended up interfacing with a very excellent company. Uh, they, at the time, they were called Mogo, and they were making flavored mouth guards. And I thought that was brilliant in its own right. And they started labeling these flavored. I played football one year, and I do remember taking that really card out of the mud and having to put it right back in my mouth. It was not pleasant. So I thought they had a brilliant product and I started listening to them and they started, they approached Dr. Julian Bales. They wanted their mouth guard to be represented by Dr. Julian Bales. I mean, this godlike creature that was in this movie concussion in 2015. Yeah. And Julian just said, Hey guys, I'm really, really sorry, but I, I, I don't believe mouth guards can prevent brain injury. Besides, I have this bird brain doctor that I think has figured it all out. And I'll be damned if they didn't say, well, can you introduce us? We'd like to hear what he has to say. And then it was just kind of off to the races. And they're the ones that started down the pathway. We negotiated forever. Mm -hmm. Couldn't come to terms. And they started putting terms out um, for a license agreement. Luckily, at the time, we had a massive company also bidding against them. Uh, they didn't believe that. But we did. And so next thing you know, we got to pick and choose in the best of all worlds. And we got a very reasonable uh, scenario where it was about a three-year runway where uh, I was consulted and, and paid as a paid consultant for them while we started interfacing with the FDA. And then the FDA is the one that dictated all these studies and tests that we had to do. And thank God, because I didn't have the money to do all these studies right. that the FDA was telling us that we had to do. And, and so ultimately, um, you know, it came around that we had a product and the, we, we spent, I can't even tell you, probably close to 50 iterations of the Q collar itself. Okay. Now you asked the question, where in the world did the Q come from? Well, it turns out uh, when I get into a process, I go into what's called immersion in my mind. And it's in my book, if you guys care. But it talks about the fact that I read everything. I read somewhere around 50 articles a week. Mm. And, and, and my eyes, I'm sure, are going to fall out of my head one of these days. But at the end of the day, I came across a Dr. Quinkenstadt. And Dr. Quinkenstadt was a surgeon for the German side in World War I. And he ran out onto the battlefield. He put a little spinal needle, which they do to give women an, an epidural during pregnancy. He put a little spinal needle in the lower back of a soldier that is down and unconscious, hit by shrapnel. He needed to quickly determine if that soldier was salvageable. In other words, if, if shrapnel had hit a spinal cord or part of his brain, they couldn't help him. They had to go on to somebody that could. 
And so then he would put the spinal needle in and then reach around and touch the jugular veins, filling up the cranial space and the spinal fluid would go up that little needle. And he knew, oh my God, it's all intact. Everything in this guy's working. Hey, get him over here. Get him on a stretcher. Let's get him to surgery. Let's find where the shrapnel is. Well, as it turns out, that maneuver became the only way to assess the neurological system in every hospital in the world from 1918 when he did it all the way to 1970 when they invented CAT scans. That was called the quaint stop maneuver. So if you're a young doctor out there, you've never even heard of this. Right, you're right. Trained after 1970. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so in honor of this man that I feel I would not have realized what could have happened if I did not start reading his work, um, I've, I named it the Q collar at that point. And then the, the next company that licensed it from me, uh, agreed to take it forward as the Q collar. So it seems like he kind of had this mindset of, I guess the fluid, uh, in a brain and I guess filling that space up. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, filling a, that, that, I guess the, the space between a brain and a, and a, and a skull up with, uh, essentially fluid in this case, it seems like, uh, maybe well, it's really- really- thinking traumatic brain injury other than the fact that believe it or not you're not going to you're not going to believe this he was killed by a traumatic brain injury from an ox cart falling on him you cannot make this stuff up right yeah. and all of history you can go look for you can, again I'm shilling my book here but we talk about it. I give him a whole half a chapter just again in honor of, of how this guy just you know, scientifically went about how can I determine how to triage these people that have shrapnel holes in them, right? And so if you if you ignore history, you're going to repeat it. So that enabled me to go on a pathway. We'll call it, I had to choose between 50 rabbit holes. It let me jump down the first rabbit hole correctly. And I mean, is that time saving to be able to do that? No, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, kind of moving back, could you explain about the... Uh... I guess the joint venture that maybe it seems like you wanted to do the joint venture, but it ultimately led to a license, licensing uh, of the, the the IP. What made you want to, I guess, start with the JV? Because it seems like a lot of people as they're kind of developing their IP and have you know, maybe a patent or whatever the case may be, they want to just license it out to, I guess, someone who's going to take all the risk from a financial standpoint and just get the, uh, you know, they're okay with just getting that, like you said, that royalty, which is five, whether it's 5% or 7% of, I guess the revenue, what made you say, at least at the beginning, that hey, I want to do a JV? Was that because you thought it was going to be something massive or that's just kind of how you had did things up until that point? Probably the biggest issue was control. Um, so these are business-minded people and they're very brilliant at what they do. But this is a highly technical medical product and they had not demonstrated to me that they had any knowledge at all. In the medical gotcha. Product, which is why they consulted with me. I had already taken multiple products through the FDA that were wound care related that I had invented. Yep. And so uh, we just literally kept butting heads. Uh, You know, they wanted the control. I wanted equal control. And they started upping what they're willing to pay for keeping control. And, you know, I always joke around, you you can't buy me and you can't threaten me. But if you put the two together, I'm your guy. Right. (laughs) And so they they finally made some some sense to me, um, especially when I was enabling uh, being enabled to be a part of the science side. Um, don't necessarily love the business side. I sure do hate signing checks or cashing them. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, as long as that money coming in allows me to do more science and bring more conundrums to light, I'm a happy, happy camper. Gotcha. Gotcha. And and it seems like this thing is, uh, seems like going good as planned. Uh, I was kind of looking at 27,000 Q collars and I'm not sure if this was a 2023 number. So that number may have gone up. Uh, or it seems like in just one year, one year post launch, uh, a number of professional athletes or 50 NFL players you talked about uh, recently, Boston Scott of the Eagles, who scored a touchdown in the Super Bowl last year, was wearing a Q collar. Seems like this thing is received, uh, you know, pretty good by a uh, professional athlete. So, uh, it, it just seems like everything is going as scheduled or as planned, uh, I guess from your eyes or from like the company's eyes. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm getting happier every day. Uh, it took a while to get my own hometown Bengals to to look at this, but as soon as uh, Wilson and Hubbard, their two linebackers, put cue collars on, they just obliterated their uh, opponents. So I I believe that the benefit to this enables them to not be focused on 
other things uh, that, you know, this mimics a yawn. So at least in theory, it can improve your reaction time, your awareness, your spatial awareness, because out in nature, yawns are used that way. And believe it or not, professional athletes, runners, et cetera, you'll see them yawning right before they start the race. So I even patented the fact that the cue collar should increase your reaction time and all these different things. Now, please understand, these are not FDA approved statements that I'm making. We did not submit a shred of data to the FDA that enables us to put any marketing materials out there that we do all these things. Right. But out of 150 professional athletes, uh, close to 70 or 80 of them, I don't know the company hasn't told me the exact number, these professionals are coming back going, I will never take this off. Really? A different person out there. I play differently. I know where everybody is. And I just laugh because I know exactly why that's yeah. happening. My son was the first to wear it in high school football ever. And I said, hey, son, listen, I can't let you play football anymore unless you promise me that you'll wear the cue collar because the, the numbers that are coming back are unbelievable. Dad, you don't have to worry about it. Dad, I got this. I'm like, no. Son, I'm not kidding. You can't you can't play. I'm finding unbelievable amounts of hidden damage that nobody knew, but it goes away with the cue collar. He goes, You don't understand. I'm only 185 pounds and I'm a middle linebacker having to be hit by 250 pound people with the cue collar on dad. I I know where they are, even if they're coming from behind me. I'm like, now son, what have you been experimenting with? You know? And ultimately he started to convince me that it's just a different quality and level of play when you're out there for an acute collar and it's really picked up massively so so you're saying that this thing does it, it it doesn't stop with just uh preventing traumatic brain injuries or maybe concussions it provides other benefits that helps out the athletes from a performance standpoint we don't know i mean and, and i'm going to say this again it, it no. just as the studies have not been done so i it's just what i patented Right. I, I just intellectualized this from the beginning. I looked at nature and saw animals claiming this. And so the concept is out there. I want to reiterate, we have absolutely no data at all that, that says that it in fact improves that. But I will say we are looking right now at gathering up that data. OK, well, it seems like at least from the player standpoint, they, they feel like they're a different person when they have it on from a performance standpoint. Yeah, And it's anecdotal. I mean, and it may just be something that they're just going, well, I just, I can't believe I'm going to be a new person when I put this on. And you are, you know, it, it's a self-professing, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. But um, at the end of the day, uh, we, we believe that we expected this at some point in time. And the numbers that have come back are, are astounding. Um, I'm really happy to tell you that uh, down in Fort Benning down in Georgia last May was the uh, Rangers, the best Rangers uh, um, contest, I guess it is, where they bring in all of these unbelievable athletes from all different factions of the military and the Rangers uh, spar it out on, on contests. And my understanding is, is that in special forces, they don't have to wait until something is actually handed to them by the military. They get a packet of money. They get to go use it anyway. They they want to buy a different gun or a different knife or a different mm. pad or what? Well, they all started buying cue collars really years ago, right? And several of them at you know at a time where they were being studied, not actually being FDA authorized. Yeah. And then one turned to another, turned to another, and and again, don't hold me to these numbers. I was told by the company that out of 140 um, Rangers that were in that, that big contest, there were 120 of them. So this thing is not even just being used. Obviously, we talk about professional athletes and or just athletes in general, whether at the high school or the collegiate level. And but this is being used by the the the, the elite military personnel here in the uh, United States as well. So I took an investigational research board proposal. So that's how we get studies that we're allowed to actually study humans, right? Um, and we took it to him and we said, well, we're going to study IED levels of C4 explosions on human brains. And they looked at me like I was smoking something. I said, <laughs> you, you can't be serious. I go, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't understand. We're going to do it with the SWAT officers that breach buildings every year for practice. You know, they don't want to go through the front door because it could be booby traps. They right. blow a hole right next to that. 
And they're within nine feet of that explosion of, to make that hole. And it turns out these guys don't have any protection at all. Mm -hmm. So we were able to convince them by buying their C4 explosion for them. These guys are nuts. I mean, but we could we could bring them our way because, well, you want some more C4? We'll, we'll buy more C4 for you. They wouldn't be paid. They wouldn't allow it, but they would do this. And we did a tensor MRI, the most sophisticated exam of the brain before that day, and then a tensor MRI after that day. And then by digital subtraction and geography, we were able to superimpose them and determine if there's any difference from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. You would not believe what happens in just one day. Now, our studies for the FDA were one season of high school play. So no. we did that on all these kids, 800 tensor MRIs, $2,000 a scan. That's $3 million radiology bill. Okay, I don't have that kind of money still. Bottom of my shoe. But the research, these uh, independent investors decided that this was right because we walked them through why we had to do it this way. But to make a long story short, we blocked IED levels of forces entering through these uh, SWAT officers in Cincinnati, Ohio, called Hamilton County SWAT Team. And uh, we were off to the races. We were able to convince the military that we were onto something. We blocked the damage to your ears. These uh, at, at um, Fort Liberty, you know, they're firing these Carl Gustavs. I don't know if you can see me doing this, but there we go. Carl Gustav missiles on their shoulders and their ears just right next to this. And so... You get one or two of these firings and you're done for the day. You've got ringing in your ears, you're exhausted, maybe headaches, can't sleep. That's for days after just prep. Now I'm told, please don't hold me to this, but I'm told they can fire as many times as they want and they get no ringing in their ears. And in my case, I shoot regular guns and rifles and whatnot at the rifle ring. And I still put a plug in my ear and I still put an earmuff over it, even though there's no data that show that those work. But now that I put a Q collar on, I get no ringing in my ears, no matter how. Little. So, so has, go ahead. I was going to say, so it seems like the the the, the military. Not you now we talked about the the, the elite, uh, uh, you know, the Rangers, and I'm not sure if the Navy SEAL or other elite uh, uh, forces use it. But it seems like just kind of generally, this thing is kind of well receptive uh, or accepted throughout kind of different military. Uh, I guess branches. Uh, is that is that correct? Do you know how many maybe military personnel uses the Q collar uh, at this point I, in time? And you know what? If I did, I'd probably have to kill you, right? If I told you, I, I really, I really don't know. Uh, I'm right. not, I'm not privy to that. Yeah. I'll relay an interesting story though. Uh, again, I'm having to hear this through the company. I'm just a licensee, right? right. Or licensor, right? So they were standing at the top of a mountain and the international bobs, downhill bobsled and skeleton organization, the skeleton is when they go head first on a, on a ski platform down an ice channel, get banging into the wall hundreds of times. Well, apparently on every run, every one of them have ringing in their ears and nausea and headaches and all that kind of stuff. And the first guy to use it looked at his buddy and goes, I don't have any ringing in and they're like, come on, I'm, I'm calling out BS, you know, right. let me have one. And he goes up to the top of the mountain and he goes down and he has no ringing in his ears. Apparently we sold the entire U.S. national team in one day. Really? Something that they know happens at the end of a five minute run every single time disappeared. Wow. And, and so that's how this is taking on legs. What? Quick. No, it, it, this is an interesting point, just from the IP side of things, because it seems like now it's uh, it, it's you know this thing is being sold here, at least in the U.S. and and maybe Canada as well. And I was going to ask you, uh, are there plans to expand things to maybe some countries in Europe or China or other different countries? But I, I guess with an added layer to this question, because typically, and, and maybe the, the military kind of hasn't thought of this, but typically when you file a patent application, and I, I'm I, I'm kind of in the know because uh, you have to check off check off where if it's like a military uh, invention dealing with the military where maybe can get us the U.S. an advantage over like other countries, uh, you have to uh, I guess get approval from them before say selling it in a different country. Now you know typically you're thinking about bombs and stuff like that, missiles or whatnot. Uh, but with this seems like the performance of it seems like it it can give the military an advantage over other 
uh, militaries throughout the country have, and obviously the military is using it. Uh, so I guess maybe the first question is, has the military said, uh, you guys maybe, I guess, can't use this in other countries? It seems like they haven't since you're selling it in uh, Canada. And uh, I guess right. the second question is, is it uh, opportunity to expand outside of the U.S. or North America to say different other countries in Europe or China or whatever the case may be? Well, putting it back in your world, you know very well that if you then blow out an international patent, you're talking some serious money. Yeah, no, sure. Yeah. And, and so the, the decision that's very frustrating, and if I could start this process in the government patent office differently, you only have a year to decide if you want to blow this out internationally. Yep, well, PCT like, application, yep, yep. Just egregious to me because it's so expensive to do it in all these different companies. There's a patient patent cooperative treaty yep. that enables you to agglomerate a lot of these into one patent, but you have to literally get a council in each individual country. They have to translate your entire patent into their language, and then it has to go through their patent process and novelty process. And then we get office actions right back, just as if it was done here at the USPTO. And so it is an enormous ordeal to go internationally. Now, that said, Remember, I went to the military first, and they turned me down as far as taking this on and partnering with us. I, I really don't believe anybody thought I was real estate. They just thought I was a nutcase, right? And then the first place that it launched was in Canada uh, through Bowel. And so they're, they're, they're going to be hard-pressed to tell us that the company, that we can't do any of that. Our goal is to help our military. Please don't get me wrong, sure. but we're not actually making a faster bullet or a quicker way to kill anybody. We're doing no. the opposite, trying to prevent lives from no. suffering. And so this part in my mind is what keeps me moving forward at lightning speed with what I'm doing. We're saving brains faster than anything that's ever happened in the world's knowledge. So from that standpoint, I'm very proud to tell you that it, appears i i don't have a voice here it's the comp the the q30 innovations company right. the one that's inter interacting directly with the military i'm not so this is hearsay from me but right. they don't seem to be blocking a lot it's like the uh, nfl didn't block us for trialing this because they've had absolutely nothing up until this point. and our data initially was just so compelling and now our human studies are spot on I mean, really cool. No, oh, yeah, and I guess that's definitely a good point. That you know, it seems like the military, if they did have something to say, that would have been early on. But with them turning things down, and you guys become successful at this point without them, them coming maybe coming back around later on, it's like, okay, you're not going to tell us what to do. This and, and even though this device looks very simplistic, it, it's not. I mean, oh. it's it's got all these different things that are engineered in it. it. It was just beautiful engineering to do what I was actually dictating to them that it had to do. And so we had all just innumerable bioengineers, mechanical engineers, industrial engineers. I mean, you have no idea what went into this to make this thing just attach by itself. Doesn't have to be sewn into you or tethered to you in any way. And yet if someone grabs at it, it pulls away. You can't literally be hung by it all these things and then on top of it there's a memory metal inside very sophisticated metal that always goes back to the exact same okay. pressure because yep. if it over pressurized there's a carotid artery there you don't want to mess with that yep. you know and we, we had to do just thousands upon thousands of, of uh, inter interactions with people and prove to the fda that it's idiot proof that that nobody could actually harm themselves with this and so that's kind of where we're at and and people have I think there's been a a, a one percent of people send the device back and again i don't have privy to the exact numbers but something like that where people just don't like something around their neck even if it's coming from around the back right. you know some people just won't wear a hat for whatever reason right but a one percent of people say i can't i can't put this on my neck 99 percent are like okay with i have it on for five minutes i don't even know it's there for sure. Oh, yep, and, and, and that's a good point because looking at it, it looks extremely simple. But again, like you said, and as you kind of explained really thoroughly, man, this is it's, it's very kind of complicated or it took a lot to go into it to get it to what you see uh, that final iteration. Uh, 
And if somebody else wants to try to mimic it in some other yeah. country, it's going to cost them tens of millions of dollars or they can buy ours, yeah. which, you know, it's, it's not that terribly expensive, especially compared to what it's trying to compete against in the helmet space and things of this nature. And so from that standpoint, I think you get a quite a lot of bang for your buck. Well, yeah, for sure. And that's going back to the whole, you know, PCT filing and maybe trying to protect this in other countries. Cause it seems like you see a lot with, uh, you know, maybe somebody trying to get the product or buy it and try to reverse engineer it and kind of use it or sell it in their country, which obviously seems like it would be no recourse if there's no patent protection in the country. Uh, uh, but I guess that's a, maybe a, a... We have patent protection all over the world. Um, okay. So we could go after anybody that did that. Certainly oh. the largest group is the United States, and you probably know this, your audience might okay. as well. We usually, because our market here in the United States is so hum humongous, we're about 50% of the world. And then we talk about ROW, which is rest of the world. We're all, all combined is about equivalent to our market here in the United States. So if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. And so the idea and concepts are spreading out Europe uh, and Australia, I think are next in line. Okay. Actually market it in those countries. Uh, but you have to understand it's only been a little over a year since this thing launched. That meant a little over a year for revenues to come in oh. to fund the effort to go forth into another country. So right. if, if, if all of your readers will turn that 27,000 sold into 270,000 sold, I can assure you it will move into other countries. Quickly. For sure. For sure. So it seems like you guys do have protection in those other countries, but you just haven't started selling them in the countries. Is that maybe accurate? And we have FDA correlates over there so you yeah yeah I, would, I, yeah I would like you said if you can make it here then you can make it anywhere and i think that was probably the same thing with the, uh for the most part with the fda where if it's the fda approved here then i would imagine that other countries will uh not uh, it's not a given but yep. in general the fda is a hurdle way higher than anywhere else absolutely yep no i 100 right. percent agree with you on that uh so i guess maybe two questions here i know we're running up close to an hour we're uh the first question is, is the book. I, I do want to talk about the book uh, when heads come together. What was the inspiration or the motivation for the book? And can you kind of talk a little bit about the book? Because you know, obviously it kind of goes into the cue collar and this whole, you know, uh, traumatic brain injury. Uh, can you look, talk a little bit about the book? Well, I think it was probably my family that, that prodded me into writing the book mostly, yeah. right? Because they got to watch these stories in real time. I mean, some of these are hilarious. Uh, Bennett Amalu, I met, and I was actually, at, you know, again, this is that famous Nigerian pathologist that found out and discovered chronic traumatic encephalopathy. I was in Miami University, and afterwards, I saw him walking towards me, and his face lit up, you know, and his eyes were straight on my eyes as we're walking down this hall. And I'm thinking, he remembers me because he's met me once before, right? Okay. He walked right up. He says, sir, do you know where the bathroom is? You know, it's like, oh, no, you don't remember me, Bennett. I'm Dr. Dave Smith. And so he remembered at that point in time, but it was becoming clear to my family that nobody knew I had done all this stuff and it was getting very famous. And, you know, so my family was like, you know, you're not getting any credit for any of this. I'm not looking for credit. And then they're, they're quickly pointed out that I have another device coming. And so having the credibility of bringing the cue collar out, and now we're coming up with something called the Sage Rebreather, that obliterates altitude deltas, obliterates sleep apnea. We're calling it, calling it CPR for the brain. It may reverse brain injury after it's occurred. All these really cool things. And so they quickly said, you know, you need to write this book. So uh, it just published this last summer. Um, and we're very excited to tell you that it's being received very well. And it's a very different kind of book. Uh, so I'm trying to take very techno babble, crazy science and putting it into everyday people Home speak yeah. um, so th that's kind of where we're at with the book uh but yeah it's uh you know when heads come together uh is in a play on speak because it's not just heads and academic people but literally when heads Head come right. together and it goes into how science and nature figured out all these discoveries and then the whole pathway including the intellectual property pathway and the all entrepreneurial pathway to make this come to fruition so people do like that type of a, a a discussion man that it's a page turner for that well yeah for sure and uh it, it definitely seems like uh, and i'm first of all i'm glad that it's starting to give you the recognition and like you said i understand that you maybe don't necessarily care about the recognition but i mean i, I always think it's important for 
those who get their just due for their creations. And uh, it seems like just kind of over time, over the years, you've created some amazing things. And uh, it's always good to seem like to get that recognition for it uh, uh, from a public standpoint. Uh, I, I guess maybe kind of have just one last question as we wrap up. Typically, you see doctors and some sometimes it seems like doctors or, or whatnot or just professionals in general, uh, they kind of go into the, the IP or invention creative space where they're inventing products and uh, getting pat patents and intellectual property and licensing out and maybe building companies and things like that. Uh, but you typically, it seems like maybe from my standpoint or vantage point, you don't see that a whole lot. Uh, I know you mentioned earlier in uh, the podcast that you were, were always this entrepreneur from the beginning when you are, are buying companies and buying IP and whatnot. Maybe why why don't you think that uh, more professionals do that? Do you think it's because of the entrepreneur? They don't have the entrepreneur bug. Maybe that like like you did, or do do you think it's life circumstances? Because uh, it seems like that's important. Again, going back to the to the reason for the show of IP and being able to monetize of your IP and this stuff can be generational wealth in, the, in terms of the, the the money and what not. Not saying that everybody's in it for the money, but it can be uh, and create gener generational wealth in uh, someone. Uh, so I ask, why, why don't you think that more professionals do that? And I'm not even talking about just doctors, but other professionals that are out there. Cause we're all solving problems on a day to day basis that because we're, we're as professionals, we're coming across different problems. And maybe we have a unique way, a new way, as you put it, new and non obvious way of doing it, which. Uh, and put us in that realm of now we can get a patent or some type of IP, even with writing a book, that's a copyright. But why don't you think more people will uh, kind of jump off into the IP game, particularly like with the patents and things like that? Because we're all kind of solving some problems on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, that really speaks to how brilliant your podcast is. I mean, you have done a spectacular job of helping people understand there's this is a pathway. Yeah. And, you know, People, I probably get at least one, sometimes two people coming up to me going, can you mentor me? Can you help me through it? And I do. I'm happy to do it. I mean, when you've caught this bug, it's a curse, right? I mean, this is no wonderful. I am telling you, waking up in the middle of the night and having to go to the computer and start typing, it can get old, you know? So I, I will tell you that when I was going through all this, I didn't have somebody like you your podcast to go and start to understand what, what was going to, I had to literally muddle through it and trial and error. And, you know, literally failures are embraced by somebody like me. You, you can't be in this world. If you fear failure, I fear not failing fast. Mm -hmm. That's what can destroy me. And the book talks about that as well. You've got to find a way to test your theories. You have to understand that the patent is maybe one fifteenth of the issues that have to actually be solved before you have a product and you can make it, make a go of it, right? But I, I do my own patent searches initially before I go to professionals to help me on these patent searches. And if I go to the USPTO site or I go to Google Patent and I see six other people that have already come up with my idea, I just shelf it. I, I'm not going forward. There's no way I'm going to be able to protect this. If you can't patent protect it, no one's going to offer you any funding to move this forward. So I quickly attempt to fail fast on all of these 15 points and... Um, you know, quite literally, if I don't think I can get it through the FDA, I've had at least 15 uh, consultancy situations where I had to tell the people paying me money, you can't, you can't get this through the FDA. It won't happen. Mm. And they, they're like all angry and upset. And then they call me two years later. Thanks. Thanks for doing that. We spun our wheels for six months and talked to the FDA. And we're not getting this through the FDA. <laughs> so those are the things that I, I think are imperative, but your site here being able to help people understand how complex it is, however, how doable it is. If you, if you just, I mean, it's just an invaluable service that you're doing. Well, and I, and I, I appreciate that. And I think you also brought up a good point as far as, uh, uh, cause I tell people, especially you know, individual inventors who are trying to kind of go through this process for the first time, cause it can be overwhelming, not only costly, but I'm like, Hey, like you said, do a search. And number one is going to, reduce the amount of time and money that you're going to spend with me doing the search, but also uh, you're going to kind of start to understand what goes into this stuff so that next time around, you don't have to, I guess, go to me at the beginning stages all the time. You can, okay, maybe do a quick search. And if it's something that's out there, like you said, you can, okay, scrap it or shelf it and move on to the next thing. 
uh, which is a big thing. Uh, but number two, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's just a lot of stuff out there that haven't made it to market for one reason or another. And uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think that's definitely good advice to, like you said, do your own search and then, okay, if it seems good, then okay, now go to the professional, go to the patent attorney, go and have them do a search and let them know that what you found and uh, that's going to help out the situation. So I definitely uh, agree with that. I guess as, as we wrap up here, what other advice? I know one of the, the big things that you said, which I agree with as well, is uh, fail fast. Uh, it, it, you know, fail fast and, okay, if it's something that, you know, and move on to the next thing, uh, so to speak. Is it anything else that you uh, as kind of entrepreneurs are coming up and they're trying to kind of get off into this whole IP thing that it would be good for them to know? Again, you have, uh, like you said, you can sort people on this stuff uh, at this point in time, uh so is it other things that you have found out just from your journey that it'd be good for the next person to know that they're coming up to uh, kind of ease their burden of kind of feeling overwhelmed as they're going through the process? I would say uh, the people that you surround yourself with are critical. And the reason I say that is, is that I do not want yes people around me. That is a nightmare. I do. I don't. Ha I have an ego, but I don't have that big of an ego that I need to be told constantly how great your idea is. I need you to find where the holes are so that I can just trash it and move on to something else. So you need people that can critically think and frequently those are paid consultants, but sometimes they're not. I have a brother-in-law who's a brilliant mechanical engineer, brilliant. And if nothing else, if he doesn't shoot down my idea, he lets me use language so that I can speak to his people. Absolutely. Absolutely engineering people. And of course, I've had to learn how you crazy lawyers think, right? And you've got your own language too. All of this stuff has to go into play. And I'll give that one last chill for the book, but it's anywhere books are sold, there are chapters in this that go into this process that you deal with every day. And if we can get people to hone their skills, it's going to make your job, the patent lawyer, a little easier when they've already intellectualized and shot down many pathways and courses that you might be trying to claim. So a patent's only as good as it can survive a lawsuit. Yep. So you can't just look at your patent lawyer and go, hey, how, how good is this? Well, I don't know how he would know or she would know. <laughs> yeah. Well, all of this makes you want to make sure that you put everything in it that you possibly can claim and then let the patent office just start throwing them out, right? And if you start with 35 or 40 claims and you end up with 15, you're still doing pretty good. That means 15 novel thoughts that no one's ever had prior to you. It's pretty cool. It really is. No, and, and I completely agree with that. And especially as long as that uh, the broadest independent claim is valuable, that's the, that's, that's the big thing, uh, I, I tell you that I can, to be honest, get a patent on almost anything, but how valued that, that patent is is going to be a different story. And uh, right. that's uh, I mean, obviously where the patent attorney makes his money, but you know, us knowing everything and you providing all the information for us to kind of draft something. I, I Funny, because uh, a lot of inventors or engineers or whatnot, they say all the time, man, I, I don't want to your point of a different language. Like, hey, I don't understand. They, they uh, We do the inventor interview and then I take that and kind of, generate a patent application, but the language is, like you said, it's different to the point where just an ordinary person typically cannot understand it. Uh, but you no, know, it is what it is. But a lot of engineers, they say, Hey man, I, I don't understand that, that patent language or that patent speak. So the application is good, uh, which I always find funny. Uh, so no, I, I think that's great advice that you, uh, that, that, that you're saying. And again, appreciate you coming on. How can people find you? I know you said the book is, uh, can be found pretty much everywhere books are sold. So I'm assuming Barnes and Nobles and Amazon and these yeah, it's sites. literally everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, you can also go to my web page that I created. It's David Smith MD. You can get a, I think it's nine dollars and ninety nine cent digital download of that book. So if you don't want to spend the twenty bucks, uh, you know, getting it in a hard copy at Amazon or no, uh, or uh, Barnes and Noble then the download is it, it definitely there. And of course, uh, on that webpage are all my patents, they're all my interviews, all the the stuff that's happened. It's, it's actually nauseating how cool <laughs> that the, these web designers put all this stuff in there that's accessible. So you can 
learn more than you've ever wanted to know about something that no one's ever moved the needle on. But we're moving that needle now. Nice. Nice. And then the Q Collar website, is that with Q30.com or? Yeah, no, Qcollar.com gets you to the website. Uh, the, there's a brand new tactical Q Collar. The military needed this device to work to 140 degrees down to minus 40 degrees. When there was a metal, memory metal inside that thing, there was no guarantee. So it had to be all reformulated for the tactical world. This meets firemen, police, and anybody that's outdoors. Um, that's a $250 device. They're $199 otherwise. And you can use my own inventor code on the promo code that just put uh, QCaller10 and you get 10% off the clock. Nice. Nice. Um, so feel free to use that if you guys would like. Um, and then uh, you can reach out to me through my website or others. We can talk to the QCaller people. And if there's whole teams that want to buy this, then there's huge discounts that they're willing to give teams. Nice, nice, nice. Well, I, I, I definitely appreciate uh, me and you coming on. Hey, audience, definitely go check out the Q Collar. Like I said, I, I mean, I, I've had a number of concussions uh, playing football throughout the years uh, from you know, growing up all the way to uh, college. So uh, I would definitely be have bought this product and used it. Uh, one ninety nine. It seems like that's a steal without the promo, but he's also given a promo code to get an additional 10% uh, off, which uh, seems like it's a no-brainer. And uh, again, this is from a traumatic brain injury standpoint, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Dave, this has been proven to uh, prevent those traumatic brain injuries. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, and, and you know, having to go, go through the FDA, I got to be careful about our the words yeah. we use, but there is no proof in science. We have data for and data against, and uh, the data is overwhelming such that the FDA gave us the title of the first and only medical device to ever be allowed to claim that it protects against traumatic brain injury. If you look at the FDA announcement, um, it's a, to the tune of 77% in humans, 83% in animals. Um, and then we got 350 million social media hits in 48 hours when the FDA did that press release. This is a big deal. I hope people understand this and check it out. Absolutely. And I think uh, and that's the, a great way to end things. The audience, until next time, we are out.